Hello and hello, welcome back to the Ascent Cycling Podcast for the daily recap number 16 following a two-day stage on the Giro d'Italia between Sa Chile and Cortina d'Ampezzo, a stage that on paper would have been the Queen stage, Paso Pordoi, Paso Fedaya, Paso Giao, rain. Would have been pretty spectacular, but we woke up to the news this morning that the stage had been shortened and two climbs, the Paso Fedaya and the Paso Pordoi, which was meant to be the Chima Coppi, the highest point of this year's Giro, were both removed from the route. And pretty disappointing news, you have to say, Guillaume. A really disappointing news, especially when uh, there was a lot of riders that targeted this stage uh, for the breakaway, or EF, we'll talk about um, them later, but they had said they wanted to do well. And also that decision came in a bit of a shock as it appears that most of the teams were actually inclined to do the full race today. Uh, so it was a decision based on the safety of the riders or potentially on, uh, I mean, uh, Rai trying to limit the damage they'll do to uh, showing the race because we haven't seen anything of the last 25 kilometers. And I feel like for a race like the Giro, it's unacceptable. I really think it was. And when you think back to the beginning of the stage, La Crosetta, we didn't see really anything from that climb either. So the two major first category climbs that remained on the day, we didn't really see anything of. And it looked like we had a spectacular finish on the Paso Giao today. Egan Bernal attacking EF, lighting up the race really early, even in the build-up to that climb as well. And it would have been just a spectacular sight to see the riders, Egan Bernal attacking in the Maglia Rosa really early on the climb as well. And we didn't see him till the five hundred, uh, the final five hundred meters of the race. I mean, just really disappointing. It really was. We had like a couple of uh, of images here and there. We had snippets of clips, and basically it was just a jigsaw puzzle. We had to know which clip came when. At this point, uh, at one point, we had Bernal attacking and bridging to Joao Almeida, but the clip before was him dropping Joao Almeida. So we're not really sure what happened. Uh, but all we know is that Egan Bernal took the win in Cortina d'Ampezzo, getting his first ever proper mountain stage win on a Grand Tour uh, and winning in the Maria Rosa, even showing off his beautiful pink jersey as he appeared um, in the final 500 meters, followed by uh, Roman Bardet and Damiano Caruso, probably the two biggest surprises of today, if we're being honest. Uh, Bardet, who closed back a 30-second deficit in the downhill portion of the Passaggio, and Caruso, who started as a technically teammate for Landa, settling himself in second place. Uh, then moving on to the rest of the top 10, we've got Julio Chicone in fourth place, Hugh Carthy in fifth with an incredible work from EF today. Hugh Carthy might not have delivered as much as he would have wanted to, but compared to some other riders, decent day at the office for the Brits because we've got Joel Meda, who was in the breakaway, finishing in sixth place. Vlasov losing two and a half minutes. Uh, Yates as well losing two and a half minutes. And Remco Evenepoel losing 24 minutes. Yeah, Remco's race is all but run now, definitely in the GC. I think he's down to 20th or 19th in the GC. You have to question whether he's going to carry on in the race or, you know, how he's going to alter his objectives. But yeah, like you say, Damiano Caruso and Roman Barze, they were 30 seconds behind Egan Bernal. Unbelievable rise by two riders. You probably wouldn't have placed in the top five, you know, questionably in the top 10 at the very beginning of the race. They have done so well. Caruso is by far the closest man to Egan Bernal now in the GC. He has a comfortable lead over Hugh Carthy in second place in the GC now. What a ride by Caruso. The man continues to perform, and he's never actually won a stage race, as Caruso, in his career. And I checked today, his best career results at a Grand Tour is eighth place. And he's now well into his 30s, just out of nowhere. Great to see Caruso riding so well. But also, Egan Bernal. I absolutely love the images of him taking his uh, his jacket off in the final meters so he could celebrate massively across the line in the Maglia Rosa. And he enjoyed that win a lot. He did. And he really showed respect to, uh, to mm -hmm. that jersey, which I think is it's very nice. Um, and it was an interesting stage uh, because so we knew the two clams were removed, but we had a massive breakaway as we had predicted yesterday. The riders you had predicted to win were actually in that break. So you had Joe Almeida, you had David Formolo, um, and there was the riders I had predicted, not the first place, but you had the likes of Gros Chartner, you had the likes of Vainer Rubio. Vincenzo Nibali was there. He would have been my pick had I not been discouraged by my co-host uh, because he said that he could have DNF'd. Um, but yeah, a lot of riders, Geoffrey Bouchard was there to uh, defend the uh, Azzurra jersey. Uh, and very early on, that breakaway went into two distinct groups. 
uh, a group of six at the front, then a big ass breakaway just a tad behind. Uh, that breakaway got brought by by the peloton, then paced by Neos. And as we started, the first few slopes of the Paso Jiao, or even before that, just after the, the bonus sprint, I think in Caprile, we had EF taking the relay of the peloton uh, with at first Jules Vandenberg, I think, and then TJ van Garderen. Uh, and although it didn't look like it was a massive, massive rhythm, We've had a lot of riders already starting to struggle, one of them being Remco Evenepoel, uh, already at the back when TJ paced, and then Alberto Betiol. You have to applaud the man. Absolutely unreal work today by the Italian former winner of the Tour of the Flanders. I mean, he paced for so long, um, basically dropped three quarters of the peloton before letting Simon Carr take the relay. And EF had announced this morning through Ducati that this was the stage they were going to win the Giro on. Ducati apparently opened his blinds or the curtains, so the weather was like, yes, boss man, I'm winning today. I mean, you have to rate the confidence because we see we saw Astana doing that similar move two days ago, and that backfired for them. Um, Sadi, I just don't think anyone had the legs to be again right now, even if Ducati wanted to do so today. Massive confidence by Hugh Carthy indeed and EF. And I actually did listen to, I think, their sports director or someone from the EF team. And they apparently said that obviously the descending part of the stage, I think they were, they were inferring that this, the descending section at the end of the stage didn't really suit Hugh Carthy. So for them to really get the most out of the day, they needed to make it difficult early on and hope that Hugh Carthy had the legs. And I, they definitely did that, which was cool to see. And um, like you say, Bessio and Simon Carr in particular, Simon Carr, his ride today, I mean, we had the likes of Simon Yates dropping out the back when Simon Carr was on the front. He absolutely shredded that group after Betiol's incredible work as well. And like you say, Carthy, he, he didn't win out of the day, but he certainly didn't lose and he stays in third place. So I think they can be very happy because I think uh, we both mentioned the descending sections. They could have really hurt Hugh, Hugh Carthy's chances today. Absolutely. I think... EF is probably one of the only teams that actually did not benefit from having uh, Pordoi and Fedaya removed because uh, it could have been a better chance for them to um, well put some time on the riders they could have dropped in the first round that they had to do everything on the Giao today. Um, and also, yeah, mentioning Carthy's descending skill, especially technical downhill with the weather conditions we've had today. It probably wasn't the easiest of their the office for for Hugh in that down portion, but he did well to... Uh, to limit the, the damage loss. And I think he settles himself in third place of the GC. He has a little lead uh, over P4 Vlasov. Vlasov, who looked good, however, had um, an incident at the start of the Giao. I believe uh, his uh, rain jacket got co in, um, in his wheels uh, and he had to stop, then go back in the peloton, but he probably lost a couple of, um, of words here doing so. So yeah, Vlasov is now fourth of the GC. Fifth place, one of the biggest losers of the day, I'd assume, in mm -hmm. Simon Yates. Uh, and I think he benefited from having only one climb instead of three, because I believe that at his rate, he could have finished the stage tomorrow. I mean, potentially with all the riders behind him, but he'd have lost probably the GC entirely, had there been the Fazaya and the Pordoy as well. So I think Simon Yates can probably be relieved. I've apparently seen that Bike Exchange have come out and said they were one of the teams that wanted to ride the full stage, which... You know, it's probably a relief for them right now that that wasn't the case because Yates drops from second all the way to fifth, four minutes 20 down now, like you said. Terrible day for Yates and it just shows really his inconsistent form again. You know, he looked so good on the, on the Zonkalan just two days ago and then really struggling today on the, on the Paso Giao. And you have to say, on paper, the stage really suited him. So I'm not quite sure where it went completely wrong for Simon Yates today. Neither do I. I know he said... Um, or through his PR, that in the first week he struggled with, um, I believe it was a knee issue, uh, that he, he felt um, not at 100%, but I think we all thought that that issue had been resolved on the Zonkoran and then Simon Yates was going to have an incredible last week. But yeah, just two days after his, well, not domination, but his very strong performance on the Zonkoran, he got dropped by Simon Carr, who proved to be the best British Simon on the Giro today, and that's not something I thought I could say. No, like I said, great ride by Carr, really was, and uh, really great to see him really riding into this Giro because we didn't really see much of him at the beginning of the race, did we? But uh, yeah, other riders, I think, winning out of the day, you could say Giulio Giacone. He's only really cracked on the stage to Montalcino. Otherwise, Giacone's real time losses have come in the GC, and he's been pretty consistent when the race has gone uphill. So 
Chikone now finds himself sixth place in the GC, just back from Simon Yates, 11 seconds behind the British rider. But Chikone, I feel like, is really well placed to try and do his best to get podium. And another rider that is placed to do that is Roman Bardet, who is five minutes down. So there's a lot of riders just a minute or just over a minute back from Hugh Carthy. Uh, Vlasov, Yates, Chikone and Bardet right there. And then, and they'll all be looking really to try and get a podium out of this Giro, I think. Yeah, and I think the time trial um, on stage 21 will be crucial to, um, to to seize that position because there's 13 seconds between Vlasov and Chikone, so between four and six. Bardet is, I believe, 30 seconds behind um, behind Chikone. However, he seems to be the rider in form out of all uh, the riders we've just mentioned. So, yeah, he's going to probably try and, and come back. Um, and I think between Vlasov, Yates, Chikone and Bardet, except probably Julio, I wouldn't say there's one clear, clear best time trialist uh, after three weeks. So it could also um, prove to be um, a bit interesting if the gaps still are small um, coming to the final day of the Giro. Uh, and then in eighth place, we've got Dan Martinez. Dan Martinez, who I believe was with, um, I think it was, I think he was with Caruso um, after Bernal's attack. And obviously we lost coverage, so we don't exactly know what happened. But I think he probably struggled a lot in the Daniel portion because he, he lost about like two minutes on Caruso from the la- the moment we lost the images to the finish line. So tough day for Bartilej, but he's still there in eighth place, very decent time trialist. So we'll see how that goes for him. And then running up the top 10 in ninth place, Tobias Foss. Didn't see much of him today, for being honest. Uh, I think the only images I saw was when he dropped Simon Yates uh, coming onto the finish line. And in 10th place, we still have a rider from the Quick Quickstep. Joe Almeida, your pick for the win, uh, setting himself in 10th place after a decent day in the breakaway and being now the clear leader of the Quick Quickstep, the Canonk, uh, orphan of Fausto Massada and soon orphan of them Yeah, it could be, could be the case. And Joe Almeida, oh, I thought I had the pick. I really did. He was in the breakaway. He was in the breakaway from the breakaway. And then he was the best rider from that breakaway on the climb, but the breakaway didn't take the stage. So, uh, I feel like I deserve maybe half a point for that, Guillaume. I'm not sure if you'll give me that, but um, great to see him up there, definitely growing into this Giro. He really is. He really is. And I think we could have an interesting final week for um, for the Portuguese rider, especially with the stages we'll have. Coming up, we'll have Sega Diala on Wednesday. We'll have the Alpe di Mera on Friday. And we'll have uh, Alpe Mota, I believe, on Saturday. So three more mountain stages where things could change. Um, but I think if we come back to, um, I mean, the, the Paso Jao, the main issue was that we had no coverage. And I think we probably need to think of something that can allow cycling fans to see cycling when the conditions don't allow it. Although I don't think the weather was too bad. Uh, so I think that's where Italy and the Giro and Rai needs to, needs to fix themselves out. Yeah, I think you're probably right. And also in retrospect, you have to say, judging by the conditions... For the cyclists, I don't know whether it would have been feasible for them to ride the full stage at the beginning. You you, know, you don't know. It didn't look like um, the descent was too treacherous from what we saw from the Giao into Cortina Zampezzo. So I'm not sure about the, the decision to change the stage. And that, yeah, like you say, just not seeing anything from the final 15k of a massive, they called it the queen stage of the race. You know, it, it's just not good enough, really. But I think basically the aeroplanes weren't given, they weren't allowed to fly today, mm-hmm. which is the main issue caused. And obviously what they're relying on, I think, is is a 4G signal from the motorbikes, which clearly isn't working and isn't enough. So I think there needs to be some kind of B plan, which isn't that, which is better than that, because it clearly just isn't good enough right now. Absolutely. And I think there was uh, there was one person on the slopes of the Paso Gio just covering the race, on Insta Live, uh, so it proves that there there was a way to cover the 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 race. Maybe give the the shot to I don't know some people in in the cars to live stream the race, uh, or just to, to give a few informations because we were completely in the loss. I think on stage at nine, um, the stage at Bernal one, we had the tunnel about one point eight k from the line, and everyone was eager to see who would come up first. And sadly today on what was a queen stage, we've been in a tunnel for about twenty kilometers, which was just a, a bad thing, I think, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, I think that will be a need to be fixed. However, it allowed Twitter to be uh, absolutely on smoke. It was incredible. I think Twitter today came through to give entertainment 
despite not having any visuals. So on that end, chase Twitter. There was a lot of memes. There was a lot of jokes. It was quite fun. But yeah, please, Rai, fix your things. So following Guillaume's mini rants at Rai and the Giro, we hope you enjoyed today's podcast, today's recap, despite obviously not quite witnessing what was surely an incredible stage. It seemed that way from what we saw. Anyway, if you did enjoy the pod, make sure you drop likes, subscriptions, follows, good reviews really helps us out very much indeed. And yeah, heading into the first rest day, we will be doing a stage 17 Sega Diala preview separately tomorrow. So hopefully you guys are looking forward to that. Guillaume, do you have any final words? Final rest day for the peloton, not a rest day for us. Cheers, guys. See you.